Okay, welcome to the College of Complexes. This is our 495th meeting since we started in February 2009. We put a speaker on every week a different subject. We require a speaker to take a position on an issue or express a point of view. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah all right. we, we, <coughs> we, have, we give our speaker an hour to make a presentation. If they go over an hour, we cut them off. One, one, so, and if anybody interrupts the speaker, remind the interrupter, let's only one fool at a time. It's one of our rules. Then we have question and answers from the audience of the speaker, not speeches. Then we have remarks, rebuttals. Every this audience at once who gets five minutes at the podium here to respond to the speaker said for or against. The speaker is the last word, it's a comment, a comment close to me. That's how it works. But before we introduce our speaker, we have time for announcements. Anybody have any announcements you want to make? Now's the time. How, uh, I, I just wondered how is uh, the Irish Fest is tomorrow? All right. Any other announcements? Go ahead. I'll never get out of this Oh. At Fair Park. At Fair Park, all right. And uh, Julie, how's Julie doing? Anybody know? How's Julie Britton doing? Anybody know? You want to tell us how, how she's doing? You want to tell us how Julie Britton is doing? Oh, yes, yes. Come on up here. <laughs> Come on up here. Well, she looks the same as you saw her. Yeah. She's skinny. What's she lost weight? Yes, dear Beverly. Well, I tell you, her skin looks so radiant and beautiful. Uh, she really does look very pretty lying there. Her eyes open and she looks straight ahead. And her feet were wiggling. And uh, we thought she was going to wake up about three days ago or so when I saw her. She was twisting around and turning. And they moved her to room 308, I believe. And actually, when I went in, she was in room 400. And uh, the woman downstairs, maybe she's new, she said I had to put a white robe on and a mask, which I did not. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm sure you might run into uh, Patricia Murphy, who comes here. She has just been wonderful to go visit with her and all. But of course, Julie doesn't respond. Do you know why you wore a mask? Sorry? Do you know why you were wearing a mask? I know why. I know why. That's why you have it on. The Our speaker next week is John Beasley, sitting right here. He's going to talk about absurd ideas give rise to absurd results. It's, it's on your turn your chin here. I won't read all this. And uh, our speaker tonight is Calvin Bluett. He's a government professor at Cedar Valley College. He's going to talk about unresolving economic inequality between middle class and the elite. He will discuss how America should have a working equilibrium under capitalism and democracy based on current practices. However, this does not exist. He argues that there is not a working equilibrium with capitalism and democracy in our nation. Kelvin shows that he is dri drive that the driving force of capitalism is greed, and the actors in both political parties have been and continue to influence by the corporate community. He argues that democracy should be the political force through regulation to ensure that the corporate community plays by fair rules consistent with our national interests. Further, that American national and state government through its legislative authority has developed and implemented a public policy that benefits corporations rather than what is in the American national interest. Calvin points out this shift began with the President Reagan administration in 1981. The tax cut did not lead up to high unemployment, rather it led to a huge federal deficit, high unemployment stemming from the tax cut and increases in defense spending. He argues that this is a paradigm of why capitalism and democracy do not fear, uh, do not of their own demonstrate that there is a working equilibrium between both Calvin, <coughs> between both. Calvin will outline the history of this dilemma, including the outcome of democracy and capitalism during and after World War II. <coughs> President Kennedy's tax cut 
which generated positive economic outcome reflected through high employment and reduction in national debt. The economic recession of 2007-2008 and President Trump's tax cut of 2018. It will conclude by identifying the causes leading to the preceding observations and recommends a solution which will alleviate this dilemma and move us to a political and economic system which will have an equilibrium between the working community and the elite. So without further ado, please give a very, very warm welcome to Kelvin Blouet. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Um, you want this? Or? Well, I'm not a new person here. I've been here for several times. Um, my observation of real brilliant people is they have maybe three good ideas during their whole life. And, um, and I think, and I've dealt with some of the issues that, that I was concerned about, and this time it was difficult to come up with anything new that I really had a passion for. So I began to look at the inequalities between the working middle class and the elite. And I, and I think this is something most people don't think about, they just know it's happening. Uh, the middle class used to be a, more than 50% of the population. It's less than 50% of the middle class is getting smaller, poverty is getting larger. And many people who are not defined as being poverty are struggling right now to try to get from one week to the next. And it's, it's a high ratio of people because the, most of the people who work uh, earn less than 45000 a year. And you can't, with the price of homes and everything else, you're struggling, even if both the man and wife is working. So that's what caused me to do this. So I want to look some at the historical evolution. America doesn't, does not currently have a working equilibrium on the capitalism and democracy. The driving force of capitalism is greed. It has been bipartisan and continue to be influenced by the corporate community. Further, democracy should be the political force through regulation to ensure that cooperation play by fair rules consistent with what's in our national interest. The multinational corporations today does not have any loyalty to any nation. And they are not concerned about what's best for the United States, even though they home office may be located in the United States. They are concerned about what's best for them. And that's, that's a tragedy. During American history, there have been two economic theories applied. Lazy Fair Adam Smith, and that's when it was, we had an agrarian society at that time. He argued that competition would set the rules, and there was no need for the government to be involved in that. And somewhat, we adhered to that. And in the, in the 1920s, when we had the first Great Depression, is because we had no regulations. And, and as a result of that, we had a Great Depression. We had a large number of people who was in the stock market, jumped out of windows, and all kinds of things that happened. And, and that's because that doctrine at that point in our history wasn't working. The second theory was King's theory. King's theory said, and this really was what Roosevelt applied some elements of in trying to move the nation out of the depression once he became president. But he said the government should intervene in the business cycle, so you know, the business cycle from prosperity to maybe the early recession and back. And so we 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 applied that doctrine. Uh, while historians argue that deregulation has led to the economic depression, the application of lazy fare led to the depression of 1929, the major recession of 2008 and 2009. Uh, President Roosevelt applied some elements of the King's theory to help move America out of the depression. This involved the use of the Federal Reserve Bank, which many people get a lot, and to manage monetary policy and fiscal policy by the federal government using what they call pump priming program, put money and all kinds of activities to put people to work. And once you get money in the economy, then you can make it. We didn't quite make it. He had a lot. It wasn't, as like I said, it, he ran into a number of obstacles. They passed the laws, but the Supreme Court ruled them as being unconstitutional. Then he pointed out that I'm going to pack the courts, change the numbers, and 
So then the Supreme Court began to approve the laws and it went in effect. This really helped because many people who were not working were working, began to work in, in a number of forestry programs, buildings, programs for private and for universities and colleges and things like that. It, it, it was fairly successful. And, but it didn't really pull us out of depression. World War II did. World War II is, is really what brought us totally out of it. <clears throat> okay, World War II was this catalyst that enabled the nation to overcome the depression. Following World War II until the election of President Reagan in 1980, King's theory was applied, which created very successful economic outcomes. President Reagan coined phase trickle-down economics by lowering the upper-class income tax rate for the elite. And today, and today it's like 35%, how much, how much money? 35%, it's more, most people pay 15% because it's money than capital gains and, and dividends. And there's, there's a, to me, a discrepancy between earned income and unearned income, like, uh, uh, like uh, equities and dividends. Uh, income from work and interest is different from the dividends and capital gains. If you work, you pay income tax. And if you uh, earn your income from interest, it's taxed the same way. And even if you have an annuity or an IRA, uh, when you 71 and a half, you have to have what's called a minimum drawdown. And so if you have like 100,000 in that, you're gonna have 6,000, you have to pay income tax, add the income tax. Yet you can have about 6 million and not pay income tax only. If you get your money from other sources, get rich. So it's, it's, that's the kind of equilibrium I'm concerned with. Uh, President Reagan's uh, 1981 tax cut did not lead to high, high employment, rather, as Tom read on each repeat. The Pew Research Center pro pro report found that from 2009 to 2011, the mean net worth of households in the upper 7% of wealth distributed rose by an estimated 28%. And that's 28% of a big base, that's a lot of money. While means of net worth of, sh of households in, a, in, in the lower 93% dropped by 4%. And that was painful because inflation was going up. And so they had less, less person. This trend is now threatening the three foundations of our society. In our economy, consumer spending makes up 70% of American economic activity. Thus, with income inequality, the lower 93% has to borrow and reduce spending, which led to excessive unemployment and a reduction in the middle class. We cannot have a growing economy without a growing middle class. And we cannot have a growing middle class if all economic gains goes to the one, top 1%. One this wide inequality challenges the nation's core of ideas of equal opportunity. Since it hampers upward mobility, high, in, high in, inequality correlates with up, low upward mobility. Um, what this is talking about, right, the way things are right now, uh, middle class people always used to be concerned about upward mobility for people who were maybe in a low income or, or trying to move up. But as things get tight, uh, their attitude change and they don't promote it. So the people are kind of left pretty much to themselves. And we see like, when is the last time they increased the minimum wage? So, and so that's, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to do. <coughs> The poor and lower middle class find it difficult for upward mobility. The issue of widening inequality cannot be separated from poverty and diminishing opportunity for those near the bottom. The next between widening inequality, which is undermining our representative democracy, has long been understood. Money flowing into political campaigns, lobbying, think tanks, expert witness, and media campaigns by disproportionate governmental influence, which is a threat to our representative democracy. We cut tax for the elite, make it harder for workers to join unions, deregulate financial institutions and other advanced nations have faced similar challenges, but have not suffered the same inequality as the United States since they, since, since
since they 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 try to empower their workforce to adapt to the new economic realities, leaving the U.S. most unequal of all nations. America must limit the political influence of money in politics that is threatening our democracy and driving out the voices of average Americans. That's kind of the historical background where how we got where we are. Now I'm talking about what caused it. The core cause is greed. Uh, my purpose is to address the concern about the threat we face, both e externally and internally, threats to American greatness in the present world, but the internal threats we face at home. Further, my presentation is designed to address some of the major threats, the remarkable erosion that has taken place over the past two decades in the conduct and value of our business leaders, our investment bankers, and our money managers. There is too much greed, egotism, materialism, and waste. Our economy is over, overly fo focused on the haves and not the have-nots. The failure of, of, to allocate our national resources where they are most needed to solve the problems of poverty and provide equal ed quality education. All the stockholders of investment America is controlled by giant financial institutions. They have been neglecting the legitimate interests of the stock owners. Conflict of interest is a focus on short-term goals as opposed to long-term goals. And from a stock, from a from owning stock interest to a rented stock interest, the professive substitutes of the direct owners of stock principal by in areas, intermediaries over the past century, there has been a gradual move from owners capitalism and culminated in what is called an extreme version of managed capitalism. And say what I'm talking about here. When we tell you, if any of you have taken a finance course, one other thing they tell you, the purpose of corporation is to increase stockholders' equity, the stockholders' wealth. That's change. Now, under managed capitalism, it's increased the wealth of the managers top managers. And that's excessive greed. And they don't, they deal with short term uh, goals as rather than long term goals. And that's also has a major impact on the economy because you've got to look at something long term in order to, if you just look at short term, and they do it in order for them to be rewarded in bonuses and things like that and in stock. So that's that's a big problem that we have, and we have had for a number of years. <clears throat> okay, we provide a man provides a vast disproportionate reward to those whom we have been trusted to to take care of things, look out for us. They're looking after themselves, and not us. Manage the enterprise in the interest of their owners, of which. The first principle of finance is to increase stockholder wealth as opposed to top management wealth. The problem is characterized by executive compensation, huge amount of money. The responsibility lies with the gatekeeper we trust to protect the investors. Further, the failure of legislators and regulators, rating agents, attorneys, public accountants, and corporate directors who fail to carry out their responsibility. I believe that we need to redesign capitalization so they will benefit everyone rather than just the elite. This will alleviate the gap between the haves and have-nots. But that's not where the decision makers are. Um, you know, we know that some of the, the, the earnings of CEOs, chief operating officers, chief finance officers, and other high officials, is like I indicated some time ago, it, there is a group of people who are very, very skilled. Uh, they don't own the corporations, but they are in a position to have a major impact. And this group of people is very focused on their interests and how they are rewarded, and they really don't have any compassion of other people. Now let me see if I can make this a little clearer. Um, people who have not live like average people. They don't know how we live. Uh, this was 
particular pointed out in, in 1992 when George W. Bush, H.W. Bush ran for re-election. Well, Clinton and Hillary were not rich. <laughs> they had to do their own shopping and all that stuff. So they had a feel for how people live. But he did not because his family has been rich and he, in, he enhanced the richness in Midland, Texas and all. He was very successful. And so, and, and I argue to a lot of my peers that condemn poor people who are poor. I say, before you start condemning people, you need to understand why they function the way they do. And most of us, we haven't, I have never been poor. I've never been hungry. There's been a lot of things that I wanted that my father wouldn't get for me. He, he made the best decision if he had made had gotten a car for me to run up and down the highways in the country, I wouldn't have gone to college. So he helped me by making me work hard and say it's got to be something better than this. And so I think the point I'm making, if you don't live, it's hard to understand why people who've been in that situation for years and ever since the Depression, we came with a welfare system, we have a, a segment of a society that's their reality. Uh, Clinton tried to change it, and about 50% of the people got off. I don't know what it stands, how it stands right now. But that's what I'm talking about. And so many people who uh, make a decisions that affect us don't know how we have to live. And so they'll see the world from their vantage point and not the real vantage point. And I think that's what creates the problem. So greed encompass all the others. The next one I have is money in politics. Um, right now, as Tom preach over and over again, sometimes we laugh at you, Tom. <laughs> but we do have the best political leaders that money can buy. And they don't represent us. And I know a large number of people like Bernie Sanders. Uh, he talks a good game, but the research has been done how successful as a legislator, and he's been there, what, 30 years? 40. He passed, he sponsored seven bills that became laws. And two of those was to rename post office. <laughs> so someone like that that has such a poor record, I don't see if they're president would have a good record. Now, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson was better than that, so when he became president, he knew how to get things done. I don't think Bernie Sanders knows how to get things done. I think he's talking about something that is, is revolutionary. That's not our nature by our nation. We are more or less evolutionary. And to do some of the things he's doing, the people that some of the people support him are younger people who they're struggling and they're looking for something. And we are not really, uh, the moderns are not really dealing with that. We need to look at what's affecting everybody and try to have something packaged so everybody's going to fit it. That's the only way this equilibrium can work. And that's why it's not working. So the people with money, you know, we had the, the, the Election Reform Act that was passed by uh, McCain and another gentleman. And the Supreme Court has just about abolished every element of that law. So it's unconstitutional. And they said money is protected by the First Amendment. You can do what you want to do with money. And that's what they're doing. And we saw an example of, of, of Bloomfield, Bloomfield, the mayor, former mayor of New York. Well, he was trying to buy the presidents. It didn't work. Uh, so that's what money does. They say you can have anything you want, and you don't have the consideration how it's going to impact other people. And the other thing I see is that the multinational corporation, I think they're a bit unwise. Because we are the largest consuming nation probably in the world that they sell the products they manufacture in China and South America, South America, South and Central America, and South Korea. If we can't buy that, what's going to happen? What impact is that going to have on this, the, the coronavirus? See what it has, what is the impact it had on the stock market? I got my monthly statement and I lost 10000 <laughs> So, 10,000 in value. So, it's, we got to, I can't see why they can't see that. If people don't have money, you can't buy nothing. And that's what keeps this kind of economy going, people consuming stuff. And we influence people to spend everything. And then when something happens, uh, 
uh, the theory of, of most economists is the so-called middle class person is maybe five pay periods from poverty. And if, if something happened, you don't get a check in five pay periods, you're in trouble. Because we spend up to what we have, and we're encouraged to do that. So money in politics is something that I think is detrimental because the government is supposed to be by the people, for the people. By the people, for the people, and of the people. And right now, it's government by the elite, for the elite, and of the elite. And that's a total unequilibrium in which it should be. The other problem is the labor union. The middle class in the United States was started for people who worked in manufacturing industry. They were unionized and they got good wages and that's what really influenced us having a, a minimum wage law. And um, now that we don't have that kind of industry in the United States now, the unions are just about, they're not, they're almost impotent. Um, the big problem that's hurting labor unions is the right to work laws. Everybody in Texas know about work, right to work laws, is that right? Right to work for less. Yeah, I found right to work for less. Does right it guarantee you a job? No. Right to work for less. <laughs> no. right, to work. right not to work. Yeah. Right to work for less. Yeah. What it does, it says, you know, in on in the southern part of Texas, both the Golden Triangle in Houston, and less degree in, in like Corpus Christi, there was that's where a lot of heavy industry manufacturing particularly chemicals and rubber and steel and stuff like that. And those guys, uh, if you put the right to work laws in, if this is a union shop, another union, you don't have to pay dues if you don't want to because you're going to benefit just like the right. And when they first started doing that, the unions were kind of corrupt. If you didn't pay your dues, you'd find yourself dead. But they began to work on that. <laughs> that wasn't too wise. But that's how they weaken the union, because then if that happened, they destroy the morale, and so why does anybody pay the dues? So, and that, and that has grown uh, in the last 15 years. Uh, Scott Walker in Wisconsin, he made, it, he made it legal for public employees to organize. And, and that's been going uh, throughout the nation. And that's further weakening the equilibrium, because who is being responsible for the working people? Who is representing the working people? Not our Congress, not our state legislators. So that's what's happening. So we need to create an environment that will permit unions to grow. They too have to be regulated. They cannot be involved in corruptions and stuff like that. But that's what needs to be done. And the government, as I see the government, that's their responsibility, to make sure that everybody play by the rules, and the rules are far fair to everybody. The next thing I think adds to it is, I alluded to it earlier, is the so-called progressive income tax. Now, we've heard of Tom, and I believe John has talked about it oh, 40 years ago, and after World War II, income tax went up to like 85% or more. 80%. <laughs> and now it's now it's thirty five percent. And um, who is that happening? Nobody. No, and no, not working people. It happened to people with a lot of money. Uh, so the income tax system. And the other thing is, I think anything that generates income is it should be taxed the same way. I don't think interest should be taxed differently from dividends or equities. Uh, but interest and earned income, they are taxed differently. And just like former uh, Senator Mitt Romney, all of his money was in, it was in dividends. So he didn't pay but 15%. And so I think there's going to be some correction in a progressive income tax. Uh, I really think the name of it you ought to pay based on your ability. The more you make, the more you should pay. But, you know, in the, the 2018 tax law, it just gave a whole bonanza to, to corporations. And they bought their own stock. Uh, they, Southwestern Bell, uh, 
AT&T gave everybody $1,000, but that's peanuts. And they laid off <laughs> thousands of people because that's the kind of company that, that operates on digital and robots and it's not going to be as labor intensive in the future as it is right now. So I think the tax system should be an incentive. And the way it's used, it's not an incentive. It just further exacerbate the problem of greed. Both Republicans and Democratic parties are complicit with corporate capitalism in generating the retrograde policies that effectively dismantle the nation's shared prosperity. Income inequality was partially manufactured in Washington, D.C., and both parties did their part in encouraging this limit. While economically, economically should explain a high, our parent economic forces that has flattened labor, wage, labor wages and generated the awesome gap between the fabulous wealth and the everyday people struggling to get by. The political actors and interest groups were at the wheels and staring at every turn, starting with President Reagan reactive tax code in 1981. Anti-government slogans in the early 1980s, President Clinton argued that big government is the problem. He's a Democrat, not the solution. President Carter struck a similar prose with regulations. But as I recall, in that time, those regulations he was dealing with was needed. You had vehicles that drive over across state to California with a load. They have to drive back empty. That didn't make any sense. And those are the kind of regulations he was dealing with. But they have expanded those to something that is much worse. And even airlines. You used to fly jet to Waco, San Angelo, Abilene. I did that. I was working out of Austin, and I was flying jets there. Uh, but you can't now. Uh, so that's, that's what he was trying to do. Both parties took their cues from Wall Street and financiers and multinational corporations that were gutted us, US jobs, and wages. Their response was better education. You know, what is that? I'm going to deal with that later. The purpose of supply side economics theory was to shift the tax burden down the income ladder away from high incomes. This is the operative objective. Tax works instead of wealth has been the practical results of favoring capital return on stock. What President Trump's income tax law continued the preceding practice. Party congressional leaders jointly reduced a better agenda, had an idea to do something better, but they dropped it and went with that. The agenda describes the symptoms of the economic distress, but they're not the cause. So that's why I'm dealing with cause. So that's the income tax. I'm going to tie education and outsourcing and factory location together. Uh, we all know what has happened with factory location. We've got to understand is that the similar line jobs that existed 20 years ago, 10, 20 years ago, they're never coming back. We cannot, the companies cannot be competitive in the world with that kind of operation. It's digital, it's robots. But those jobs do create a large number of technical jobs that our children are not trained for. And many adult people are not trained for. And I completely point that President Obama recognized that in two of his state university messages, and he wanted for those people who was affected by outsourcing and factory location, and structural change in the work environment, training, and he identified the kind of training that was needed, maybe six months, maybe a year, not more than two years, to give the people a stipend to live on, and pay their tuitions and buy their books. And then that is not a gift, but that's an investment in human capital. And we've got to invest more in human capital, because that's the core of everything. Uh, so, but the Republicans wouldn't fund it. Hillary Clinton didn't even mention it. <coughs> Bernie Sanders did, and President Trump did. But nothing has been done to, to deal with it by President Trump. So that's the dilemma that is created. And many of these people who work unionized jobs, made good salaries, they were taught a skill, and I know personally, my, older, my younger brother worked for Umco Steel. And after about 15 years, they closed the mill. 
and he was never, he, the only way he was able to make another, someone about 10 years later bought the bill, the bill and reopened it, and he worked about another 10 years, and they closed that. But that started after World War II because most of the factories of building and the allies that we supported in rebuilding were more modern than those that were in the United States. And that created some of that problem. But someone needed to be observing that and, and saying, no, we gotta do something different. So that's the thing about it now. Education, we spend, you know, a good much of education. Higher education is extremely expensive. Uh, student loan debt is 1.5 trillion. And Bernie Sanders is going to forgive that. I don't know where he get the money to forgive it from, but he's going to forgive it. And uh, I had to pay for mine. My, one of my daughters got a, a total $8,500 scholarship, and it, you know, equally for two year, for a year. And she got out and she made an F in Spanish. She was in business. <laughs> she lost it that last year. But it only paid the tuition that their father was dead with a problem. And so, it, but it, it, it wasn't a problem for me, but that'd be a problem for a lot of people. Uh, and, and so, but, but uh, that's, that's what we're looking at. And, and, and even, we need to, I work with young people in junior college. And I tell them, I don't know where you've been. You, you don't know nothing about what you ought to know something about. Uh, you don't have no perception of what ought to be. You have, you don't manifest a vision in nothing. Um, so those are the things I think the edu education system, it's, it's a lot of process and no substance. Uh, right now, it's a strong movement. It started way, when I was in college, uh, math science. That's when it started, when the Sputnik thing, that kicked off that. And, and that's, you know, the technical world is where the jobs are. In engineering, and in, they have some in their technology that change you, teach you how to do the work, and engineers design the stuff. And that's how it is. But you, you gotta have a skill, you know, real skill to be trained in those types of trades. You know, that's, it, that's true in engineering. So I think the education system needs to teach we need an education system which prepares students to think, analyze, and be creative. I see none of it. Uh, what I see, in memory, they can, they can recite what you see if they're listening. And uh, what I do, I give them 60 questions. Um, and I say, that's your homework, and I grade it when I grade the test. And then uh, before I give the test, I'll let one of them kind of moderated and we go through all the questions. If they don't know the answer, I'll, you know, most of them they know and I'll, I'll answer. And in that process, they all ought to make a hundred, <laughs> but they don't. <laughs> you know, you know, I can't figure that out. <laughs> if I, if I had, we, when I was in college, you didn't know what they were asking. You had to know a broad spectrum of stuff, otherwise you would fail the test. And so, but I think I, I put a great deal of thought in those 60 questions. I think if they really know that, they'll have a pretty good body of knowledge. And so, that I think that's worth the doing. Uh, this should begin with pre-K through high, high education. High school and universities should have opportunities for not only to study the things they're gonna be in, but I think our children are too slow to decide what it is they wanna do. And John, you know, in European nations and everywhere else, but when you finish what we call middle class, you better know, because they give you a test and you go technical or professional. And, uh, and well, my smartest child, the ones that PhD in physics, she said, Daddy, they all, you know, girls just robbed their father. He, he, we can't say no. So she said, Daddy, can I, uh, how long do I have to be in college before I determine, decide, determine a major? I said, not longer than two years, because the first two years you take general courses, you won't lose too much. And she, at the end of the, the beginning of the junior year, she selected physics. <laughs> so she never had a part-time job. Uh, she said nobody would hire her. And she was the most gifted one, because she could see somebody do something and do it. Uh, the, her twin sister, she was good at nursing, and she has compassion and stuff like that. So she. She's a nurse, so she's a good nurse. And, uh, so, but I mean, those are the kind of things that 
students need to, the earlier you start it and you know what you want to do, the better you're going to be with it and when you get there. And that's what happens to a lot of students in America. They don't make a decision early enough to use electives and things like that. They still have a few of them, not like they used to have in high school. And the other thing is people need to have internships of the reality of what they're trained to do. And I know that particularly because in 1960, engineers, am I getting close to you? Engineers uh, at Prairie View didn't have any practical experience, no internships. They would let them visit something and they would learn, try to learn everything they can just by visiting to get a feel for it. And, but that's not true now. They get all, they get all the opportunities to get internships. And if you go through an internship and you do well, they'll hire you. But if you don't, you gotta have better than a 3.5 to get a job. So that's how important that is. Uh, the second, the, uh, the last is partisan gerrymandering. I think that's a, a big issue that we need to deal with. Now, <clears throat> the court, uh, in a case involving Edwin East Johnson District, Sheila Jackson District in Houston, and another district in North Carolina that came before the Supreme Court, and they ruled on that oh, 15 or 20 years ago. But the decision was, you cannot draw a district for a particular demographic group. And what the irony about it then is, most of the districts in Texas were all white. <laughs> so, but you can't, you, so Eddie B. G. Johnson district was, they had a narrow scope from downtown in South Dallas and South Partners going to Hamilton Park. And the district was about 6% African American. So they had to redraw that district to where it was less than 50% African American, but probably 30 or 40% Latino. And so they did that to solve the problem both in Houston and Dallas. But the case in North Carolina was can you German a district to benefit a political party? And the answer was yes. And, it, and the Supreme Court reaffirmed that a few months ago. So that's what created the problem is political parties drawing a district, particularly when they dominate the legislation in the governor's office. And that's where it's gone. The negative of partisan gerrymandering, the Republican is using it to gain legislative majority throughout America. Recently, the Supreme Court ruled that it is constitutional gerrymandering to benefit the political party. Gerrymandering can be sorted into three parts. Motive, extreme partisan redistricting is part of a general pattern since the 1990s, referred to as constitutional hardball. They change government in fundamental ways in violation of customary norms, but without transgressing the letter of the law. So that's a gerrymandering, and I'm gonna have something to say about that later. The next, the next issue is, I don't know why I did without where to talk about this. No, 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 no. Uh, oh, that's, that's, now what I'm shifting to is solutions. What steps can, can be taken to fix the preceding issues? Okay, corporate greed. Capitalism must manifest principles which can be depended on and fair equilibrium between the working class and the elite. We need to come away to eliminate greed. That's a big one. Uh, but there, there, you can legislate ethics in governing greed, and that's what I'm trying to get to. A fair compensation system where the focus is on increasing stockholders' wealth as opposed to management wealth. Government regulation to reduce inflated stock gains. Uh, restructure governance to ensure that chief executive officers does not share, serve as the chairman of the board and the CEO, which in my opinion is a conflict of interest and there should be some public directors. This managed capitalism, the CEO determines who's gonna be on the board. And, um, and they pay them a fee. Some of the people that serve on the boards make more than the average person that works. And so if, if the CEO is the chairman, do you think they're gonna vote against anything? There's no stewardship there. 
and 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 um, I often say my paradigm was that uh, I thought Bank of America we used to be nation banks. In Texas in the 1980s, every bank went bankrupt in Texas. The same kind of stuff that happened in 2007 and 2008, inflating real estate stuff. And Nation Bank moved in. The president of Nation Bank was one of the best bankers in the world. But <clears throat> with the elimination of the glass Stidgill Act, a bank can be not only a bank, an insurance company, and a brokerage company. And an insurance companies can do the same thing, and brokerage companies can do the same thing. There's no regulation. They can do all of it. If you win, you win big. If you lose, you lose big. And so I was, I was very impressed with Merrill Lynch. And I just never thought that Merrill Lynch would ever go bankrupt. But they did. And so the government put pressure on Bank of America to, to take that over. And that almost made them collapse. Now the reason I'm saying it, banking is complex. <coughs> uh, I've never worked in banking, but I worked in insurance and underwriting. It's complex too. And brokerage is complex. So one person may be like, he was good in banking, but he wasn't good in brokerage or insurance. And that's what I call about ego. He had, he had too much ego to try to hire someone to run the, the brokerage part that was good in brokerage he was in banking. And someone in insurance, he, he wanted to make all the decisions and he didn't have the knowledge to do it. And that's almost caused that bank to collapse. <clears throat> so that's what I'm trying to get with. <clears throat> uh, the CEO should be the CEO, not the chairman of the board. Um, I think some companies are doing it, like if you have a labor union or, or employees, they are to, they have a plea to have a broadest perspective. At least employees should be on the board. And a lot of them, a large number of the board members are not people that own the most stock in the company. Because, you know, that's intimidating to the CEO of the chairman of the board. So that's what I think they need to do. Shift from managed capitalism to owner's capitalism. And require the gatekeepers do what they do. You remember Enron in Houston? Oh, yeah. They encourage or force all their employees to buy stock in it. It went bankrupt, and they lost everything. And the accounting firm that's going to be looking after them was, was a big part of it, Arthur Anderson. It put them out of business, too. Uh, you've got to have regulation that's fair to both all parties. And they got to follow the rules. Greed blinds you. And you only focus on what you want, and you don't think about what impact you may be doing hurting the company down here for real. That's why I focus on short-term goals. Uh, changing government emanating from failure of stewardship. Government legislation and regulation to ensure efficient regulation create independent public directors. Public accountants. We must celebrate achievement over money, character over charisma, and substance over over, over, over form, of substance over, over style, and virtue over prestige. Further recognize reason, principle, and conscience as the great jury and arbiter by conduct and spontaneously urge to action rather than inaction. Now, when I talked about money in politics, the core was Citizens United decision. And what I think needs to be done, we need a constitutional amendment to reverse that. And I've read all the Federalist Papers, and there was no Federalist Paper that said that people with money should buy government. No, the, all the people there were wealthy people, but that was no infer in, inference that that was what it was supposed to be. And I don't think, uh, I don't think, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's a bad decision by the Supreme Court. Uh, <clears throat> money is not speech. You know, years ago, they defined a corporation as an artificial being. You can sue and be sued, but they didn't say it was a person. And that should, that's what we ought to be standing on, not this new decision. We need a new, need a new move, need a movement 
For shared prosperity, a scale similar to the progressive movement at the turn of the century. We are not implementing public policies to upgrade skills of America, improving our infrastructure, and strengthening our safety. The nature is how do we strengthen labor unions? The worst, first thing is do away with right to work laws. Create an environment. Uh, we need federal and state legislation that create an environment for labor unions to strive. The first step would be to start with legislation to rescind all right to work laws, to ensure that employers will withhold union membership dues for labor unions. This would also mean that white collar workers could become union members and private corporations and national, and national and state and local government. Right now, I pointed out, Scott Walker is a movement among other states to make it impossible for public employees to organize. And there ought to be somebody that speak for the working people. And right now, the weed labor movement is too weak to do it. And so that's why I'm sitting. The American needs a middle class constitution that depends upon relative equality across classes and especially strong middle class. Representation is designed to channel differences across class interests, not warfare between the classes. America has this kind of government. We have conflicts and polarization, and rather than people saying, you know, all in this box together, let's work so we all can succeed and not. So that's the question I'm getting. Uh, has that kind of con constitution. We can, we can adopt massive structural changes across society. The changes would include support for labor unions, break up monopolies, reinstate glass and sickle, public funding of elections, ways to limit the revolving door and provide, uh, provide fair, you know, equilibrium. The latest one is make federal income tax tax fully progressive. There should be no difference between uh, uh, wedges and interest as opposed to equities and dividends. And to an example I alluded to earlier, uh, if you buy RA, you got to pay income tax on it. And I know, I don't know everything about it, I've never worked much in private industry, but I have friends who've had companies who were very successful companies. And what they did, everything loaned to the company, even the house they live in, the car they drive right around in. And I know there's been an issue about the income tax, high was too high on companies, but not too many people were companies were paying it. They wrote that stuff off. They were not, they didn't really need that. Uh, so that's, that's, what I, that's what I'm talking about. And like, if you're rich and you have a net estate of six million, you don't pay no income tax. But if you have a $100,000 our aid, you're going to pay the income tax. You didn't pay taxes on building. That was a annuity system, was a great system. At, I know DISD had one. My wife worked for DISD and she, she didn't like to save money, she liked to spend money. It's kind of a break on that, but she told me later that was, I was right. But in, when she, the twins were 11 years old, I believe, she went back to work and I just told her to take her money to where she wanted to. But they showed her where they, she put $300 a month and her net pay would be the same. That's all she was concerned about, the net pay. And when she retired, she had almost 100000 Uh That was a good program because a lot, of, she was not alone. There's a lot of people like that. And so that was a good program. And, and, and I think we need, that opportunity should be available, I guess, to everybody because would it be a big loss to the government? That's a lot, that's a lot of money. But you get it back. Um, oh. So those are some of the changes I think we can make in, in the income tax. Uh, I, I don't want to use income tax as a, as a barrier to incentives. Income tax should be an incentive to cause people to do the right thing, not the wrong thing. And that could be done but it takes some thinking. One of the problems that the government has, and this, I'm, I know about, more about that than I do other things, is if the government plans, the corporate community said that's socialism, and that brings it to a halt. But if you don't plan, you guess it. And the government shouldn't be guessing, we should be planning. And so, but people need to have open minds, and planning is not necessarily socialism. We're planning 
to make the best decision for everybody, not just for the elite. Corporate corporations have been planning all the time. They have an international organization that meet in Switzerland about four or five times a year. It's created by the multinational corporation. And they invite presidents and leaders of nations if they need them. And they plan everything for everybody. If they can do it, the government needs to do it to even, you know, to be able to do the regulation that we need to do. We need a tax on the following investment products, short-term financial speculation, activities that dominate and distort financial markets. A tax on trade of stocks, derivatives, and other financial instruments in order to curb excessive speculation, prevent stock crashes emanating from the investment tool. I'm just going to point an example. Recently, most of you remember, the 2008, 7 and 8 was a banking and a mortgage problem. We voted $700 billion to bail the banks out, but they paid it back plus interest. Uh, $800 uh, something to bail out mortgage companies. And, but this involved a lot of citizens too, because when that happened, interest rates went way low. And then when people went back to refinance their home, if they had a re revenue coming in to pay for it, then they wouldn't lose it. But too many people, because they spent everything, could not pay the reduced amount after refinancing, so they lost it. But the thing they created was called collateral debt obligation. And all of us in your open, we know what collateral is. And that seems that you've got something of equal value that if you don't pay it, it's there. That was created to create securitized mortgages. They were sold all over the world. Now here's AIG, everybody know AIG, one of the largest insurance companies in the world. It says, well, we will insure and they were called credit default slots. <laughs> when they found there was no money involved, it was all credit. That was going to force AI, AIG to go bankrupt. So, you know, you can stimulate the economy, and the government began buying their stock. Uh, the stock. And the stock went way up. And the government sold the stock <laughs> for capital gains. So some of the idiots who <laughs> were the government had been out of business said they want to sue the government for interfering to participate in private business. But they forgot about that soon. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't do any work. Um, so so we, we, we talk about what to do, do with that. There are issues people have no control over. This is something we, some people will get. And I think middle class people forget this. There are some things we learned in, in, during the Great Depression, 929, that there are issues, I'm um, there almost, there are issues that beyond the average person's control. And that's what we're facing today. And there are average people who have no control over their lives, therefore technical changes are dynamic and ongoing, and the government must invest in human capital this is not a gift, rather an investment in our nation. And what I, my solution to partisan gerrymandering, and it shouldn't be done by legislators, should be done by nonpartisan commissions that have a staff to do it. That's my report. Questions? You, you didn't you didn't bring up my suggestion to burn the Constitution. <laughs> no, but you and I had an argument together some time ago. So I'm going to <laughs> expand on that. You know, at one time the sun rise and set on the British Empire. Didn't. What happened to it? It's the economy of scale is what happened. To it. <laughs> Actually, it is what it's what happened. But I'll, I'll, when I when I get up, I'll, I'll speak. But, um, Anyway, um, so now when, when you come to, to uh, corporate greed, don't you think that uh, corporations have no moral values, and, uh, you know, or ethical values whatsoever, other than being greedy and getting as much as possible? 
Uh, so, so to um, you know, ask them to reform and become moral seems to be a few foolish quest. Don't you think? <laughs> uh, it seems unrealistic, but I think that we got to do it. We got to do it because that's creating a lot of uh, a lot of problems. Uh, you know, I remember in the eighties it came out that the MBA programs did not teach ethics. And they began to require it. And for a short period of time, I saw some ethical behavior, but it's, it's the last 10 years, it seemed to have dissipated. And, uh, and so I think, you know, I think the citizens gotta be fairly astute and know what's hurting them and, and speak to it. And then if not, we're gonna get what we have. Uh, Calvin. The coronavirus, you alluded to it. Yes. Uh, what effect, long-term effect, if there is any, do you think will occur? Will that have a leveling effect? Or is it going to affect the economy? We are right now seeing the stock market very much affected. Just what is your projection? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had, similarly, we had uh, the... Sears. What? Sears. Well, we had something recently, and see, it came from Africa. What was that? Ebola. Oh, Ebola. 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 It was just about as bad. But we, we went, we, we, you know, I worked in the public health service. We have some very skilled people, and the president would be wise if he listened to them. They know, they know what's going on, and they know what needs to be done. But he doesn't, and he needs to let them speak to it and give them the flexibility to do it. Um, the president. What? Can you speak into the mic, sir? Okay, the, the president needs to know because the president doesn't know everything. No, and, 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 and so that's why I have aides to give advice and things like that. But they, they have a good plan because it, it's, we've had a long experience with immunization. A long experience because we love, a lot of people used to die from tuberculosis, pneumonia. And a lot of other things that we have now, this is not an issue. It's tuberculosis is coming back, but it's because of people coming from other countries here and bringing it here. But my projection is we need to use the best minds to deal with that. And I would guess that this is going to be fairly short term uh, because China is making some pretty good improvements already. And, uh, and I think we can do the same thing and try to minimize it. We don't need to be guessing about something like the president said, oh, three point something percent like that. We don't need to be, this is an issue that everybody needs to be conscious of because we all could be affected by it. And you know, just like they're closing down big vineyards in Austin and other places, that's going to have an economic impact, short term. Because we don't want the thing to get out of hand like it is in, in, in some parts of China and, and in South Korea is having a big problem with it too. And also Iran. New York. Yeah, New York. But it's the biggest problem is in Washington State. That's the biggest problem right now. But it could be anywhere. So that's that's how I, I see it. I think we need to let the people who have been trained and know what they're doing. I believe they know what they're doing. The, the public health service has done something bad. That the, the Tuskegee thing, I thought that was wrong. And, and then a lot of African Americans didn't trust it. But uh, because of that, yes. Calvin, I used to uh, correspond uh, with a uh, gentleman from Holland on email. His name was Juiced, and uh, he and his friends went to figure out this uh, global worldwide conspiracy, and they found out that a House of Orange member was on the board of every one of the top 100 corporations, so they concluded there was no conspiracy. Now, my question to you is, how do you... Uh, how do you quantify greed? Who is greedy? Who is not greedy? I mean, I can think of a presidential candidate right now who is criticizing millionaires a little bit less since he now is one. That's not, that'd be, you asked him for my opinion because I don't have no facts on it. What I look at is when people make decisions based on best, what's best for their corporation or for them, I consider that as greed. Because any decision that's big, that's made, will affect a large number of people. I think greed is a, 
is the core of, of everything that's going wrong. And I, I just think that people need to be conscious of it and know it exists, but we have a citizen a propensity to try to think whatever people are doing and making a lot of money is, is good. And that's not necessarily good. It's good if it helps everybody. Common good. But if it doesn't, it's bad. And that's how I see greed. Um, I know about the conspiracy theory and I'm, uh, the this global deal that I mentioned. They are beginning to focus a little bit on poverty and things like that. But it's is very quietly they are doing a great deal about it. And I understand the person you're talking about, what, you know, the people that are radical, whether they're liberals or whatever they are, I don't think it's good because that's not what the real issue is. Uh, we have so much debt. And some of the things have been recommended right now, I don't see how they can fund them unless we just stop funding something we have right now. And, um, uh, increase taxes, and all that's a possibility if it gets down to a real crisis. That's the best answer I can give you, John. Well, I've been taking notes while you've been going along here about different things along the way. I struck out a lot of them because you covered them very well. You know, we're pretty, pretty close to nature, I think, so. so good job, first of all. Uh, I think the key point that you didn't mention uh, is when I heard from my brother who's a little bit older than me. Uh, there was an America once upon a time where dad went to work, mom was at home. You know, we had the post-World War II economy, the traditional family, one wage earner. There's a point where that all changed. Does anybody know when that happened? After World War II. No, After World War II. It changed the, the life had to start to go to work. They started changing then. They started changing then because yeah, women was, were not willing to be home like they were. There was before. one key event that just shattered that. What was it? The 1973 oil crisis. That's when America changed. That's when, you know, we lived in homes that weren't investments. Nobody bought a home for an investment. But all the, you know, and then all of a sudden, build a home, that was a hedge against, you know, it became a, an investment at that time. All of a sudden, it became more prohibitive to buy, buy a home at that time. Interest rates, cost of materials. But we were getting cheap oil for a long, 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 long time screwing the rest of the world, basically, and living fat off of it. So that, that would be, I mean, you covered everything else. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't focus on that, but what you're right, it, but it was, changed. but it really it started after World War II. It did, well. And, but it, it accelerated at that time. Well, we were, because, we were uh, living on borrowed time. Yeah, but see, my mother never worked. Yeah. Uh, but all my sisters had to work. I understand. I came from a family like that, too, but yeah. a lot of America, you know, had what I described going on. Yeah. But you know, the the, the beaver yeah. all. And then when that happened, the cost went up across the board. Everywhere. It's a horizontal thing. That changed everything. Here. And so it was a husband couldn't make enough to do it. It took both. Everything else you spot on. Calvin, um, great chat as always. Yeah. Um, I understood what you were saying about you know, with regard to paying uh, taxes on the IRAs, you know, because that's pre-tax money. Annuities, you still have to pay taxes. And right. it's income tax, it's not capital gain tax, it's actual yeah, 15%. income. No, more. IRAs are at your income tax rate, not your capital gains tax rate, because it's considered uh, untaxed. I know, I know. I, yeah. I, I agree with so, you saying, I hear what you Yeah, so there are different rates. It really depends on where you fall on the spectrum. Um, I get a little lost in uh, when, when you mentioned, you know, gee, someone would have to pay tax on the 100K IRA, uh, but no tax if you had six million. Uh, what, where are you coming from? It's the law has been paid. It's the law has been paid. It was a million dollars years ago, but they increased it to five or six million. Yeah. 
Are you talking a state? The state, yeah, yeah. Oh, still, well, the, per the person, yeah. can, you can, you don't have to pay taxes on that amount. No, yeah, well, it depends on what you inherit. Because you will. I'm not talking about the inheritance. I'm talking about the person who created the estate. He doesn't. He or she doesn't pay no taxes on that amount. That's what they call an estate tax. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, the person inheriting it. Yeah, and it's up to six mil now per individual. Yeah. Okay, I get that. So I guess I was a little confused where that was coming from. My misunderstanding. Okay. Okay. It may have been mine. But but it's I if they inherit IRAs, they will pay taxes. Oh on yeah, the you IRAs got and also annuities. Annuities, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I was making that correspond cor correlation because, you know, they would get the IRA and the annuity, you don't pay income tax while you're going on. You benefit from not paying. It helps you with your income tax, plus you save some money. Uh, but and I also pointed out that most companies, <coughs> most people who create that kind of wealth don't, don't pay no income tax either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was the difference I was looking at. But they also changed the IRA rule recently. Yeah. So now the kids have to spend it or, or be taxed on it over a 10 year period. Yeah, well, if, when you get, they told the me when I was 71, I couldn't buy an IRA. No, but you can buy Ross. Yeah. Convert. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Calvin, thank you for a good presentation. You did hit on several nerves personally, which I would like to address. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you very well. Okay. <coughs> I am an independent financial advisor and have been for a number of years. I'd like to bring clarity to, to a couple of points you made. IRA is a tax code and annuity is a product. And annuities by and of themselves are not taxed unless they are in a IRA qualified plan. That could be an IRA or 401k and so on down the line. Because the contributions has been deferred and the government always wants their tax and the earnings are deferred, when you get to the other end, which is 70 and a half or at this moment, about to change to 72 in the next couple of years or so, they want all of that earnings that fund taxed. And the tax rule is the RMD, the required minimum distribution. That's how much you have to take out of which portion is taxable and a portion is excluded. They'll, they'll penalize if you don't take that. Uh, annuities can be both qualified and non-qualified. As she mentioned at the end of her comment, Roth IRAs or a Roth uh, code is not a taxable event. You can put money into it with after-tax dollars and it accumulates deferred and you take the money out tax, non-taxable. This is that, kind of like municipal bonds. Exactly. And I know one man who was a self-made millionaire who's bought millions of dollars of municipal bonds in order to have that tax-free income. And he lives quite well as a result of that. <clears throat> uh, the Enron you mentioned in Houston, I can't think of the CEO's name. I want to say George or something. Say, right? No, it was uh, Ken, 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 Clay. Ken Clay. Ken Clay. Ken, Ken, right. Ken. And the other one was right. uh, Sterling. Right. What people don't know is that when he filed bankruptcy, he had in excess of $4 million worth of private annuities that he had purchased on the advice of his advisor, and that was sheltered from his bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So his wife, who was so worried and publicly announced this, we're gonna be broke, didn't realize at the time, thank goodness for her own uh, But they didn't do anything for knowledge. The, they didn't do anything for the employees that lost their Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but that's an issue of another discussion. Um, AIG is the largest insurance company in the world. They have over 350 divisions all around the world in different corporations, of which 13 are home-based in the United States. And I'm very proud to share that my sister was one of the first corporate presidents of one of the 13 companies here in the United States. Now, see if you can turn that into a question for Calvin. Beg pardon? Turn it into a question. question. Well, I'm help. just making observations. I, well, this is a Q&A period, so. It has to be a question. We okay. tried, we tried. Yeah. 
It was interesting. Where'd you buy that shirt? Uh, you, you, want, you come up and rebut and you can do that. Well, in that case, I think I'll tell you what I'm saying. No, you are very interesting. But you, you need to rebut and do it. Do you have a question? He was just correcting me on something that I made. I, I was expanding your knowledge rather than challenging him. The comment, my comment was because he said he was finished at this point, it doesn't need to be a question because he said he concluded his comment. So, whatever. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Uh, Medrick, be careful, you may have to walk home. <laughs> Well, Kevin, as usual, you uh, knocked it out of the park, and I really, uh, I, I, I know that, you know, I, I don't have the patience to sit down and do that kind of thinking and researching, so uh, I, I certainly admire you for that. But I am a uh, minor stockholder in a major corporation. And you didn't say much of uh, anything. I didn't hear you mention the stockholders. And occasionally I get a chance to attend the uh, stockholder meeting once a year. And the amount of uh, pressure that the stockholders put on the uh, CEO and, and president or whatever, and that I want my dividends maximized. So I don't care what you have to do. I want, so my question is, what do you see? Or how do you see the stockholders themselves, which are people <laughs> like myself, uh, the pressure that they put on the, the management of the company to maybe facilitate corporate greed? Okay, let me point out, um, Medrick is a very successful employee of AT&T. Um, and he did some outstanding works at the company. And I'm saying, but what, my point is this, I know that stockholders can go to director's meeting and express their concerns. But my point was, they don't select the stockholders, the CEO does. The, the, board, the board of directors. But, they, but under the advice of the CEO. Uh, yeah, so what, what I think should happen is the board need to represent the stockholders. If they represent the stockholders, then the decisions will be different. And that's, that's what I think should happen. But if they don't, feel that they have to, they don't feel that they're recognized, re representing the stockholders, they shouldn't be on the board. Okay, I'm gonna turn some stuff around into the form of a question. Would you agree or disagree that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, shelter, and all that stuff, um, I agree with that. So if I want nice clothes, drive a nice car, live in a nice area, does that make me greedy? No. That means you have a vision well, for yourself. I understand. I'm just trying to get you to I'm, I'm, clarify the difference between basic need versus the level of greed that we well, I'm, I'm obviously talking, I'm, have. I'm concerned about those people who can't get enough. They have that's more money, so that's greed. I agree. And, and then that's too much, and you know, the one top 1% one control too much. I agree again. And so something, you know, something has to be done because it's nothing, there's not much left for the rest well, of the people. let's turn it around the other way. We have a uh, system of business here that says if you work hard and you work smart and you do the right things, you're going to do better than your neighbor down the street or next door or the office next to you. 
should you be penalized for being successful? Does that make you greedy? No, no. no. I, I, would I said with, we don't need to destroy incentives with, for, for people to do the right thing. But when you that too. So, but when you're talking about much more than you'll ever need at the expense of someone else, I, that's what I'm concerned about. Okay. We're on the same wavelength. We're just speaking perhaps a different words. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my question. Did you see the movie Parasite? The Korean movie? No, for some but reason. About I used to be an avid movie goer, and I, my, exactly my wife and I stopped about. going, and I haven't gotten back into it yet. You know, the 1% and everybody. Yeah. The knees and the gutters. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. No more questions? So I can sit down. Yes, you can. <laughs> well, uh, it's your turn to talk now, so who wants to, I can see who wants to be first here. <laughs> well, everyone is uh, learning about the coronavirus as a uh, former business owner. Uh, I wonder how many of you know about the 941 virus? That's the same thing, isn't it? The 941 virus is a uh, payment that hits quarterly when you do matching uh, funds on your employees. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the 941 virus I'm talking about. Um, I think that the ability to run a business is not really being respected. I think it's being underrated. Uh, and um, I, I know of only one passion that is possibly more destructive and maybe destructively evil than greed, and that is envy. Because I think that biases people's, I, I believe that biases people's uh, uh, estimation of what's going on around. We do have a, a problem. Um, you know, I've spoken before that if you want to find one term that encapsulates many of the different things, I mean, who killed JFK, who did this, who did that, I can use two words, a phrase, big money. Big money did that. Big money did this. Well, well, um, who, is, who is big money? Big money are the ones who have enough cash to go into the politician's office, throw a bushel full of uh, cash on his desk, figuratively, and say, um, I'd like this uh, regulation passed, or, or I'd like this law changed. And the politician says, hey, I think that's a grand idea. I think we should do that. What happens is the small businessman is then regulated out of, uh, out of uh, business. And what happens is that, uh, for instance, I had a uh, friend who ran a jalapeno ketchup company, and he actually worked hard and he got a um, contract with the US military, and they were supplying jalapeno ketchup over in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, during some very important years there. Well, what happened is uh, big money stepped in and uh, passed regulations through their fam famous, their favorite Congress critters. And um, then Del Monte took over his business. So this is something that is a constant thing going on. And I, I guess what I'm saying is, is uh, I believe we're misdiagnosing the problem. We're misdiagnosing it because of our envy of those at the top of the heap, and we're not seeing what's really going on. As a uh, video guy, uh, I've never been hired by a poor man. This is not how it works. There has to be somebody with enough uh, money that they're going to have the disposable income to uh, go ahead and hire someone who provides my service, has my skills, and so forth. And that is true of 
many, many, many businesses. So what I'm saying is, is inequities in income are what drive a robust middle class. You guys got it all wrong. The problem is with the very top, those who can manipulate Congress and your local politicians even, and have their way with the rest of us. Thanks for a, for a very um, informative speech. I enjoyed it. Um, but I do think you, uh, where we disagree is, is the Constitution. I, I do think the Constitution is, is the root cause of this greed and so on. And, and it's, it's sort of simple, really. The structure of, of the Constitution says that every two years, the whole of Congress gets elected, okay, uh, the, um, the House. And, a, every, and a, a third of the, the Senate. Now, that means to say that you're in continuous election. And, and that costs, I mean, even the presidential election, I think, costs something like um, three billion. You know, the, the, the amount of money needed is enormous. No other country has this system. You know, in England, you have an election every five years. And, it, and so they spend about a tenth, in fact, what America spends. Japan apparently spends 1%. So it's a system that requires this huge amount of money that causes, you know, what I, what I call democratic um, corruption. You, you really, in my judgment, you don't have a democracy. You have a kleptocracy is what you have, where the rich are the people with money. You either have Wall Street or the corporations. In fact, you know, Part of the Constitution was the creation of the Supreme Court. What a ludicrous Supreme Court you have. I mean, they, they defined, um, even though at, at, the, at the local level, the state level, they were very worried about the power of money of corporations and what it would do. It was the Supreme Court that, uh, in the, um, I believe, the 14th Amendment, overturned that, made corporations persons. <laughs> How ludicrous could you be? And of course, then you had in the last uh, few years, well, nine years ago or so, Citizens United, again, a, a ludicrous decision, you know. So again, it allowed corporations. So really, it, it's, it's, it's the combination of the, well, I think it boils down to the Constitution. That's where it all comes from. The Supreme Court that has that sort of power. You know, um, you know the power in England is, is in the commons, the, you know, who, who are elected MPs. They decide. Uh, certainly, you know, it was only Tony Blair that introduced the Supreme Court in England. And guess what? After we had that, you saw all kinds of favorable laws for credit card companies and so on and so forth. I mean, that's what you get when, you know, the rich would always capture the, um, I mean, that's what, um, if you read the um, Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx, that's what he said. The, the, the ruling class will always capture the government. And that's exactly what they've done. And so yes, I think it's 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 it's, it's in the constitution. You know, so as I say, look, that was the constitution. Uh, you know, it, it's like as a thing. You know, it's sort of pickled in aspic. You know, it, it's it's there. It can't change. In England, that was a set up 300 years ago, as I said. But we've moved on. You know, we we don't have kings with power anymore. But now, because of the constitution, you have basically. A, a, a king by common acclamation, with, with the same powers that the king had 300 years ago. Well, the king, queen, and England have no powers anymore. Very, very little. You know, the, they have a cabinet like the president has, but that's within parliament. And the members of parliament must be elected in peace. Okay, they can't just, like, you don't have Betsy DeVos, you know, who has no qualifications other than loves private schools and stuff and religious schools, you know, that's about her main claim to you know, her job. And you have, you have the, um, these agencies that, that are, are, you know, are political appointments. Well, you know, goodness me, they, the, the, um, the people that run the um, agencies in England are members of parliament, actually. 
So the whole system is different. So, you know, I, I, I do think the Constitution is to blame for, for the greed. It's, it's in the nature of the system. It's just what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and as what's happened with, with corporations, basically, um, corporations, you know, the board of directors were set up by the, by the owners, which were the investors, to, to look, oh, look, you know, supervise the, you know, the company on their behalf. But the whole thing has been reversed, as you said. You have the, you have the CEO who lets the ball. They don't give a damn about, really, the owners. You know, and, and, and this farce, you know, of the stock market, we've just seen what happens. I mean, half of this scare of um, coronavirus is was, was, was the um, was Walmart, you know, was the Wall Street just you know, pumping up in the scare and the price. You've seen it this last week. It went up. You know what? What? Ten percent lost. Ten percent. Then it gained five percent. Came down again. It's driven by you know, pure speculation. These people. You know, Corporations were meant meant for for real investors who stick with the with the company. Now it turns out the only people who care about the long term interest of a company are the employees. It's certainly not the top guys that run it. I mean, the, basically the top echelon, they get the stock options. They, they want to maximize it for about three four years and get out. So what do they do? They it's easy to pump up the price. What you do is you, you cut research. You know, you, you lay off people. And of course, when you lay off people, the price, stock price goes up. <laughs> you know, hey, you know, they, 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 they actually, they, they do things to destroy the long-term viability of corporations. And I've seen some, I mean, I've, look, I've been fairly near the top of, you know, corporations and seen what they're up to. You know, <laughs> there's not much intellect there at all, really, other than greed and, you know, big booming voice. You know, and, you know, they, they're generally without intellect, is my judgment of them. And that's, this is the problem in America. You know, you, you've got donkeys <laughs> leading lions, <laughs> basically. And, and you're right, they, they, they're greedy, and uh, mostly they're ill-educated simpletons. That's because they're so focused on greed and vying with one another. Can, can I buy a bigger yacht? But the real, actually, the real problem in terms of the economy is when these people have got so much money going to the 0.01 percent, that money goes in assets. That's why you see in Dallas, house prices go up and up and up to a point where it's become unaffordable for young people to even rent these days. It's all because of these is 0.01 percent. All this money flowing in from California, and of course, you know, it, it it's actually in the long run will will destroy, you know destroyed Dallas if this goes on because uh, but you see the, the, what's happened with the wealthy you know the, the uh, point over one percent you've got levels of inequality not seen since the early uh, about the, the uh, 1920s and it's even gone beyond that and of course this is where they put their money in assets but they're non-productive assets and so for, for an economy to grow it needs productive assets so, so when you have this going on, it's actually hurting the country. Also, with the corporations deciding to ship the manufacturing base overseas to China, and I heard some poor lady in London say, "Oh, it's it's terrible. I can't buy my cheap goods from China anymore. You know, the dresses I sell." Well, and you know, I'll point out next week. You know, there's a big difference between you know the individual economy and what I, what I call the macro economy. Most people think they're the same, they're definitely not. Very, very different. And I'll bring that out next week, but uh, yeah. You know, until we start having people in government that understand that and actually care about America, instead of going half the way up to destroy it, actually, which is what they've done, you know, over the, led by the right wing, you know, lunatics and nitwits. <laughs> yeah, that's all you can say. <laughs> You know, there's a, you know, there will be no future really for this country unless unless this greed is got rid of, unless Congress has some moral ethical values. Not don't talk about religion like Pence does. You know, another another you know, prize clown. <laughs> um, 
you know, this, you know, but you see people are so gullible, you know, they're so ill-educated about all this, and they, they, so they believe the nonsense that, uh, and I've had my five minutes, thank you, sir. <laughs> say before, uh, you don't have to be a student of history, you know, to get along in life, but to forget the history you have already lived, to me is unforgivable. And most of us have, you know, at least uh, lived a half a century of history, right? At least. <laughs> well, I was being generous. <laughs> but the point, we haven't hit the, the 100 yet, let's put it that way. Um, but, you know, what you were saying, Calvin, also about the 70s and affordability and stuff like that, and, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And if you were working class back then, it was very easy to work your way into a middle class lifestyle, and that meant owning a home and having kids. <laughs> And, and even having the, the little woman stay at home with those kids. Um, but, you know, and put them on through college. This was not a king's ransom to have these incredibly basic wants in life, okay? And also, people had the ability, because Glass Steeple was around, to actually save for those little wants in life. You know, you went to the bank, you had a little passbook, you got five and a half percent, and before long, it built up, you know. Um, but what also happened along the way is that I don't understand, and maybe because I come from a working class background, uh, I don't understand why people, um, even back then, but very much so today, do not understand the difference between needs and wants, okay? And it's like we have consumerism run amok and people are buying stuff that is for hundreds upon hundreds of dollars that are junk and made with junk materials that we would have passed by in the 70s. Fabric is not fabric anymore that we used to. I mean, it's it's in, un, in the inconceivable to me. And plus, you know, you've got all this little chit chat to sophisticate somehow all of this. Um, you know, we're going to monetize everything we put in front of you, and so you have every celebrity in the world going on and saying, "Well, I partnered with this person, and and we worked very hard." to get to the point, it took us over two years to get this perfect bourbon and this and that and the notes and this and that. I mean, it's absolute crap, okay? It doesn't get anyone through the day. It doesn't make people focus on the fact of um, trying to develop short and long-term goals. They, they don't even have short-term goals because most of the time, because everything in front of them uh, you know, as interpreters, I must have this, I must have a new iPhone this year, I must have this, I must have that, uh, that um, even from the short term, they can't buy, you know, plan to even pay off the credit card, much less have an apartment they could afford or go into a home. And those are, those are just the people that actually are working that are living like this, the middle class. So the working class, forget it, but they could get themselves into trouble too, okay? We seem to get around okay without phones when cell phones weren't around, okay? We seem to be able to connect with each other, we caught the buses, you know, neighbours looked after the kids or kept their eye on the kids if there was a, a lucky kid. So, you know, uh, there's a whole... the beyond the greed that's in our society, it's also, you know, how people think about things and what they really place a value on. The, you know, that too is eroding 
as far as I'm concerned, you know. And yes, they give um, the uh, the uh, big business, they, the people who buy the, the rubbish, uh, and it is, by the way, Republican rubbish, uh, of uh, the corporations, the corporations somehow you know, if we just give them some more money, that's going to really help these guys that are really struggling up there to try and create jobs for you. And we all know that that's a bunch of crap, okay? Uh, they could care less about you. John and I had the privilege of riding a very nice ride in corporate America in the 70s and 80s with Xerox. And uh, all of a sudden, Reagan comes in, you know, uh, with his wondrous economic plans, and then all of a sudden, life at Xerox, as we knew it, started to erode, okay? And yes, corporations uh, at the top in those days actually did trickle down benefits to their employees that those employees didn't have to pay for, okay? Has nothing to do with envy. It has everything to do with greed and people that are working today, I, I'd hate to think what it was, would be like to make a living today. So um, now we have capitalism on steroids because even back in the 70s and 80s, we didn't talk in terms of billionaires, we talked in terms of millionaires, okay? And then the greed took over and then when Xerox started, as did all the other corporations that then started to ship more jobs away. Um, you know, what was obscene to me working at Xerox is that they'd be laying off people, okay, to make their bottom line look that better. Um, and at the time, during one of these uh, um, reduction in forces, guess who the two top stockholders were at Xerox? Paul Allaire, President and CEO. And the second one, the, B, um, the VP of Human Resources. And so they were in the process of, you know, putting all these plans together to lay people off, and they were going to get big bonus at the end. So how much do you think human research uh, was even motivated to even help people relocate places or go into yeah. another job? And then it just got nastier and nastier as, as it went along. You know, it went through, you got six months notice, you know, and probably a decade later, no. Susie, let me see you please. Oh, here's a box, put your stuff in it, you're walking out today, okay? And that's how corporations do it. And uh, that behavior, nothing for anyone to be jealous of there, because that's a character flaw that I would never want to take on. So, uh, you know, people have to try and connect back with each other and yes, they should demand. Government is the only one that can set the ethics at this point. You leave it up to, um, you know, the corporations, <laughs> forget it. I mean, it's a pipe dream. Okay, now, how bad has our um, capitalist greed gotten, well, and, and infected government, which we know it's very much bought and paid for, but for the leader of the supposed free world, this week and the last week, um, what does he do? Trot along and say, coronavirus, no problem, it's, it's a cold, you know, it's not a big deal. And, um, and so this week, you know, this um, narcissist um, extraordinaire um, walks in to look at a, a CDC facility, you know, and he talks about uh, all the kits that now he's blamed, is trying to shove off that it's Obama's fault we don't have the kits, even though he's, you know, the majority of the staff is gone from the CDC and, um, you know, the uh, NIH. So he walks in there this week and he is saying, I can see your hand waving, but I'm going to make this comment. Um, he is saying, oh yes, we now have the kits 
and uh, anyone can get them. In the meantime, they've only tested 1,850 people in the entire population of over 340 odd million. Um, but in any case, and then he has to, see, he's downplaying it, and then he says, um, you know, and the kids are great, they're fantastic, they're perfect, perfect kids, just like it was a perfect letter, and just like it was a perfect uh, transcript. I mean, this guy is so freaking narcissistic, okay, that even a virus that could take out, already has taken out 16 people, okay, in a very short period of time, that could really have an impact, not only on the health and welfare of the citizens that he is supposed to protect and defend, okay, but yes, it could screw up the economy big time. But which is more important in the final analysis? For him, it's the economy because the stock market is what he's interested in because he's got to have those numbers up there to, you know, win in November. So that kind of leadership, you know, that's, that to me is the ultimate ugliness of capitalism. When you have the leader of your country trying to lowball the impact of, um, you know, what a virus could do because he doesn't want to screw up his economy for his electoral, you know, perspectives. And also he, um, you know, is downplaying the, the percentage that could be affected in the world, you know, and going on Fox and talking about, well, 3.4% 3, 3 is too high. You know, I have a hunch. He can take his hunches and shove them where the, the sun don't shine because he's worthless to begin with. Thank you. I get very angry. <laughs> Otherwise, he's one again. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, I say, before you start hating me, uh, a pox on both parties. So, <laughs> just so you know where I'm at. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, the, every election I bring up uh, this point and then it seems to go away and the pol some politicians will bring it up as well. So what, what we've been talking about tonight is any tax accountants in here, CPAs, anybody like that? Jerry, I know I probably don't have a ride home either after I make my comments. But. So everything, uh, Oh, one, you know, what, what she said about people's needs, that's, that's a big part of our problem. You know, we don't, we live in bigger homes than we grew up in. I, I grew up in a house with one bathroom when we all vied for it. Somehow we got through the, you know, the 50s and 60s and that's not my five minutes yet, Jerry. Don't wave your hand at me. Well, you, no, you, you missed that time. But, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. A lot of our problems are these enhanced needs of things we don't have to have, but that's built into our consumers. Absolutely right. But every election, so everything we've talked about tonight is centered on taxation. I used to, has anybody ever heard, I worked in business magazines for 20 some years. There was a magazine called Industry Week. Anybody ever hear of that one? Uh, they had the Best Plants in America awards every year, and they had an ad back then. It was a very effective ad, I, I never forgot it. And on one side they had the Ten Commandments, and on the next they had book after book after book, which were tax laws. And they said at one time, you know, this is how we live, this is how we live today. They were talking about the burden on corporate America, the artificial costs to avoid taxation, either personal or for business, that are naturally put in place that don't have to be there. And that's the crux, as I see it, of everything we've talked about tonight. Oh, right, right, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say 10 minutes already. But, but uh, you know, simplification, a national sales tax, I tell people that all the time. That's all we need to have is a national sales tax, throw out everything else, and everything will run beautifully.
consumer, you know, we, if politicians were making laws to feather the income of the government, we would have terrific policy. Because that, and I've seen it happen. I used to work for magazines that government people got. Our, um, one of the most unwieldy parts of government is the General Services Administration. They have a big, uh, they have a big presence in Fort Worth at the federal building there. Back in the time of Clinton and Gore, when they were reinventing government, that was a real thing. They were actually streamlining how the government procured goods and services because it used to take years, if they wanted it to be, to get a government contract. Well, all of a sudden, they, their funding was predicated on getting income from the vendors who were going to be doing business with government. They would pay an override for, um, you know, to the GSA, which was going to be self-funded inevitably. So, I, mean, I don't know if you knew that or not. But that policy went into place, and all of a sudden, these contracts that would take endless amounts of time to execute to get on the federal supply schedule were going through in like 90 days. You know, so government can really streamline itself when it's given the means, as can corporate America. You know, they are taking short-term profits because that's what you're telling them to do. Our companies are very good about incentivizing, as is our government, if you give them incentive. So if take away all the artificial taxation, doesn't need to be there, put a federal sales tax up in place, nothing else, take everything else away, I think uh, you'll see a lot of changes. So that's, that's it. Well, now I am uh, speaking after both the Brit and the Aussie, and um, I don't know what to say. Actually, uh, I'll just direct the um, comment to uh, Calvin as far as, you know, we could say this whole talk is about taxation. I would rather that we characterized it as whether government is the most efficient way of dealing with the issues you brought up or whether it should be taken care of in another manner by the market or, or by the culture even. Uh, in the early 70s I traveled in India and uh, one of the things that I encountered there was the culture if you were a wealthy person and you did not do charity work, if you did not build for the homeless, if you didn't uh, see to the people's needs, you were scum. How did we lose that here in this culture? Well, it, uh, I think uh, part of it has to do with uh, the large metro areas. I don't think anyone in New York City or Los Angeles uh, uh, worries very much about that kind of censure, but uh, I think it used to be in, in uh, hometown America, what you know, Main Street America, wherever that existed, that um, people really were, if, if you were wealthy, you were under pressure to, to help your community in different ways. And uh, um, I'm, I'm putting my vote in for the accumulation of wealth because not only have I never been hired by a poor man, but when I examine the people who are actually doing charity in this Metroplex here, it's the wealthy people who are doing the charity because nobody else has the dough. And uh, I, I know of uh, 10 particular very wealthy people who uh, feed uh, just a huge amount of the homeless here and, and they don't make any big deal about it. But uh, they uh, individually, not really any organization, they, they contribute to some of the local charities and they make them, they make them a real thing. And uh, so again, I think your view of greed is, is very damaging. Um, uh, we need a cultural change. 
Um, he who dies with the most toys does not win. And uh, I think uh, that would be the essence of it. And as far as uh, the Constitution being the, the problem, John, yes. we have had some real, uh, uh, real slaughter of the initial intent, uh, especially the uh, 17th Amendment, which put the senators up to a um, general vote, rather than being really on a leash to the uh, state legislatures, which is the way it was. And uh, that's kind of like a no confidence vote. If the senator is up there uh, listening to the lobbyists and not the people of his state, he's liable to get that uh, cane and be drawn off stage. So um, I think the major problem with the Constitution is nobody's following it. Nobody was. No. no one is following it, and that kind of goes down through some of the current laws. Wow, there we go. Okay, I didn't even go after the I didn't even go after the Aussie yet. First off, I'm American. That's number one. Okay, um, but uh, you talked about who he who dies with the most toys doesn't win. And all I can say to that is, he who dies homeless in the gutter hasn't won anything probably for a long, long time and certainly did lose big time at the end, okay? And that is happening more often than it should ever have occurred. And it's not only, you know, in the big, cities like a New York or a Los Angeles anymore. It's completely up and down the coast. It's uh, out of sight and uh, to privatize uh, the many things that you're referring to, John, I couldn't disagree more. Uh, we let um, business manage itself, you know, and we ended up with a Boeing 7 37? 800. 800, whatever 800. the hell it is. Okay? Um, no, I am, and, and the fact that government has been reduced because we've given so much of the line share, we basically told business, go out there and do whatever the hell you want. Don't worry about antitrust uh, laws or anything like that. Um, you know, banking, no glass eagle anymore. Have at it. And by the way, if the consumer has an issue, they can just chase their tail into government agencies that are, have already been underfunded. So there's no one there to answer the buddy 800 number anyhow. And, uh, but, but never let it be said that we don't ha keep our citizens in mind. Again, all these laws are written by the lobbyists and it doesn't happen in Washington. It happens, it starts at the state and local government level and it just, you know, you just get into the bigger leagues when you move to Washington, but you've had plenty of practice here in Texas alone with um, uh, APEC writing most of the laws that we run by today that at least benefit business, okay? Um, so I don't, uh, we need more government uh, legislation. We need government legislation that is first and foremost uh, center front is how will this affect an American citizen and if you say and because I believe in the Constitution as well John okay and I uh, believe that it is a great document if it's implemented okay and their implementation or being implementing that document the founding fathers as far as I'm concerned didn't have Citizens United in mind when they wrote that document. And I think that everything that they thought that Congress and the President and the Supreme Court were supposed to do, first and more foremost, was in service of the people, not the corporations, but now control the people at every level. Because even if you, um, you know, they own your heart and soul from a consumer perspective, okay, uh, but they also have, over here, you know, rating agencies. 
that's going to say how much we, more we can strip from you. You know, because we'll tell you what your credit worthiness is. And it's being sent out to everything and it dictates every part of your life. I consider that to be an obscenity, quite frankly. Before that rating system went into play, people managed to get loans at banks and buy houses, buy things on time or what have you. So all of that crap needs to go away. Because that doesn't serve the, per the citizen. That serves the corporations okay, that the citizen goes to, to go on and do their life. So anyhow, the, the Constitution is great, could be great. It has been demolished a little bit over time um, with the laws that they've tried to come up with and Citizens United and, uh, you know, is, is a prime example of a Supreme Court saying that somehow the Constitution, you know, isn't uh, right, they got it wrong, and they didn't get it wrong. And there shouldn't be any such thing like that around, and um, we need to get back to, to basics and build a government and have them run the show, okay? I take my inspiration from Kreb Kaur, not from the later de Tocqueville, although he had some things to say about America. But Kreb Kaur's perception about America was that any man from any class of society in Europe could come and make his own fortune, his own destiny in the frontier of the new land. This is still a frontier. It never stopped being a frontier. This is not, uh, the Constitution is written for individual rights, not individual nurture. It is there so you can make something of yourself, not so you're taken care of from cradle to grave. I guess I'm the last one standing. Uh, I want to thank our speaker. I think he did a great job here tonight. Guys. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Something, capitalism has to be harnessed in order to work for the benefit of people. Otherwise, it's destructive of the general, welf of the general welfare, uh, which under our Constitution we're obliged to protect. It's something we seem to forget about. And that, that, that is the gist of what I would like to mention. Uh, Today, we talked about a lot of things here. And uh, capitalism, we're, we're not, we don't have any truism in this country. There's no capitalism, communism, socialism. It doesn't exist. We only have degrees of ism. And as soon as someone starts talking about socialism, then they turn them off and immediately. Or they turn, anytime you get caught up in an ism, you're in trouble. So stay away from that. We have a mixed economy. That, that, that's what we have. We have social security, we have everything. But uh, we have to work with it. And if you look at what's wrong with government, I've said before that we have the best Congress money can buy. It's, that's one of our problems. And uh, we've, uh, we've, one, one of the ways to correct that, uh, we, Citizens United is one, but, but uh, before Citizens United, we had the same problem. We had a problem then of, of Congress controlling everything and money controlling Congress. And one way to tone, tone that down, in my opinion, is to have free elections. Last, maybe the last 90 days of a general election would be free, and uh, the, the media won't like it, but they, can, but they can raise the price of advertising to make up the difference, and the congressmen will vote for it because they'll get to keep the money they raise, and they, it'll work. And so they'll be for it. And what will happen, though, is that it'll cut down the time of elections. You won't have two years of of running for an election, we time down to say from Labor Day to uh, Election Day, 60 days. That's it, and uh, they, <clears throat> the, they they won't spend money before the election time because it'll be a waste of money. Because the opposition won't spend theirs, they'll get free air time the last 60 days and beat them up, and uh, so it would reduce the time for elections. It would make a better society, and would get the money out of elections and would you know, the people the congressman would end up representing the people instead of representing the people buying their vote for election that might help our system that's one of my views 
But uh, anyway, I better shut up while I'm ahead. And I give this back to our to our speaker here. He did a great job. Um, a couple of issues that were raised, uh, I touched on them, but I didn't go in depth. It was a lot of stuff, <laughs> and I had to set priorities. Uh, one of the things I, I think uh, I was in my report, I don't know whether I made it or not, I made it past over, is that in elections, I think they should be financed by public finance. And we had experience with that, even the state of uh, Arizona had a public election thing, and the Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional. But if the people, are, if we're going to have a democracy, really, the people got to have a stake in it. And right now we don't, because when we had the campaign finance law, two thousand dollars is, you know, you give two thousand dollars, and who can do that? Only the elite. Um, you know, I give Hillary maybe fifteen hundred dollars, and I was struggling to do that, but that didn't count. It's got to be much more than that. Uh, I was giving it for good government. So those things I think we got to do. We got to change some of those, make some of those changes. I tend to agree. I, John, it's what you've been socialized under that, that sometimes offers a hope. The Constitution is that it for me. Uh, I know in England their experience has been different. And, uh, and I do think elections are too long. Uh, I don't think House members should be running every two years, maybe every four years. Uh, now those are some things that make sense because all we out there are trying to chase money, and the average person don't have no money to give them. And so all the money they get comes from people that want something for the money. And so that's the system we got to try to get rid of. But I think it's a role the government is the, is the one in the position to do it if it would do it. But the Congress has a great deal, a great deal of impact, and and President may be exercising more authority. It's been growing for a number of years, but it wasn't designed. The framers did not want it that way. They wanted it to be different from what they what they perceived the experience of war in Europe. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I expect more pushback than that. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's it for tonight. They kick us out of here at 10, I think 10.30. Yeah, Our speaker is still here. We want to talk to him. Okay. That's the end of the formal meeting. See you next week.